Welcome, welcome, welcome to another amazing episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, host with the most, Ben Reeves. Joined today by Alex Stadnick. Hello, friends. Andy Reiner. How's it going? Hi. Hello. And Mr. Board Game himself, Matt Miller. How's it going? How's it going, dude? I feel like you should have your doctorate in board games at this point, right? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Do they they offer those? I don't know. I think you've spent enough time, though. I think you could probably get it. (laughs) If Mario can get one, you can get one, dude. I would think so. I'm going to start asking around. (laughs) That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do to get those doctorates, right? You just got (laughs) to find somebody who's ready to give you one. Hey, can I have one of those? (laughs) Next time you're at your doctor's office, just be like, hey, do you mind if I borrow that? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think so. All right. Well, I don't want to worry you guys, but uh, there's a killer in our midst. (gasps) It's this show. This show is going to be killer. We have a great killer show lined up. We have later on in this episode, Nate Fox, the creative director of Ghost of Tsushima. I butchered that name, I think. Ghost of Tsushima? Is that how you you, say it? I think you're getting it pretty close there, Ben. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did it right for the interview, and I have not done it right since, but... Anyway, he's on. He talks about Ghost of Tsushima. He talks about the comic that inspired the game. He also talks a little bit about the one film you should watch before playing the game. So I'm not going to spoil Empire it. Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> oh, well, yep. That's the you, film. You Sorry. got it right there. It, surprisingly, Star Wars did come up as well. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Listen to the interview. Yeah. Uh, but before that, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these Xbox games. And uh, but before even that, I want to talk to Reiner. What? I know your playlist. You've been you've been checking out a certain game that might be exciting. Are you still playing Sea of Thieves? That's where I'm going. <laughs> yes, I am. 15 million players now, and you're one of them. Yeah, he, he didn't want to talk about Sea of Thieves. He wants to talk about Star Wars Squadrons. That's right. Yeah, yeah, Star yeah. Wars Squadrons. I didn't get my hands on it, but Alex and I actually watched uh, a couple hours of footage. Right, yep. uh, four or five matches yep. of. Fleet Battles, that's their kind of big flagship multiplayer mode where um, you have the Republic going against the Empire. These are classically designed originally original trilogy ships. So you got X-Wings, A-Wings, Y-Wings. Well, Rogue One's U-Wing is in there as well. Very cool new ship. And then on the other side, you know, every kind of TIE you can imagine. The TIE Reaper, TIE Fighter, TIE Bomber, TIE Interceptor. So they're clashing and There are two giant flagships that start out on the far sectors of space, and then they're slowly moving in. And the goal of the game is to take out the the rival flagship. First team to do that wins, right? Um, Very typical multiplayer mode. We also checked out dogfighting, which, you know, is TIE Fighters going after X-Wings. Very much a spiritual successor to the X-Wing versus TIE Fighter game. Yeah. And uh, both modes look really fun. There's a bit of an overwatch quality to it in that all those different ship types i just talked about kind of play critical roles and different roles so you want to have kind of a you know your your team comp with certain objectives and uh maybe strategies in mind and on top of that you can have 50 different components in your ship so you might have a tie fighter that has weak shields well guess what you can improve those shields with an item uh give it different kind of types of bombs or weapons to outfit it in a different way for different needs. So there's a lot of depth there. It looks very cool, beautiful, stunning visuals. Uh, You know, the backdrops, it's not always just space. You get the big gas giant from Yavin Prime. Uh, Asteroid field, you even go in the rings of a planet or the the ring of a planet, you know, like Saturn. Yeah. Yeah, they have some really cool ideas there. That's multiplayer. There's also single player which we didn't get to see any of the story yet. I, I really want to know what this is going to be and how long this campaign is going to be. But we do know two things now. One, the prologue is set in A New Hope, right after Alderaan is destroyed by the Death Star. And you play from two perspectives. So you play from a pilot you design for the Republic. You get to pick gender, species, voice, all that stuff, the, the flight suit. And then you do the same thing for someone on the Imperial side. So you have uh, these two characters and you're going to see after each mission, it's going to change viewpoints. So you get to see the story unfold from both sides throughout the entire game. After that prologue, it jumps ahead to three years after the Battle of Endor into that space that Matt Miller is very familiar with and that the novels and comic books are exploring that kind of gap of time that between Return of the Jedi and the Force Awakens. 
So that's Star Wars Squadrons. It's coming to PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC in early October. It's only going to be $40, which yeah. is crazy. And there's not going to be microtransactions or any kind of DLC planned. Everything that's on the disc or in your download is there on day one. You just need to unlock it by playing the game, earning in-game currency. Can't buy any currency. Um, and just, you know, plan to unlock it like you did back in the day, like those yeah. old fighting games. Remember getting all the fighters? Um, yeah, yeah. We'll be doing that. So I, no uh, updates. You think I, they'll hold to that? No updates? You think they'd figure out something's broken like a weekend and... Well, they might have like a patch, but okay. they're not adding new content. Sure. They want to have it be like one and done, yeah. right? Yeah. You not have to yeah, support just it like, forever. Here yeah. it's $40. I like I play it enjoy it yeah i can't i'm hoping this has legs because what we saw from it i really like but i just can't imagine like you sitting there and having you know the the wealth of the prequel ships sitting there and like if people are liking this game and are engaging it from a multiplayer sense it's like how do you not add that in at some point i mean i'd love star wars squadrons to the prequel trilogy and maybe this is really just a good test case for ea to to look at this franchise and say what can we do if this is popular, what can we do when we bring it to next gen? Um, I think the one thing that remains to be seen for me is, and I don't envy Motive's job with this, was it was like seeing that footage, like Star Wars fights now are very bombastic. You know, there's crazy amounts of stuff happening on the on the screen. And to be able to channel that while also balancing like gameplay, like combat balance i think would be hard um it seems like they're off to a good start but there were some points where i was like oh i wish there was more ships flying around so right sure yeah I so, AI. yeah i so what desperately want to be excited about this game i really do should i be yeah i think so at least until you play it <laughs> <laughs> well that's, that's the thing right like but from what i've seen like, yeah. yeah it, it from feels what I've like seen, it looks go ahead it looks like the game that that I've been wanting since X Wing versus Tie Fighter. You know, okay. Rogue Squadron didn't quite scratch that itch, but this is more about the the dog fighting, those little one on one battles. You know, having all the sensors, shields, power, all that stuff on your ship that you're kind of gauging. One other thing to point out: it's only first person, mm-hmm. so you can't pull out on an X Wing to open up its S foil S foils and then go back into the cockpit, right? Uh, it's always going to be from the cockpit and you get to design the cockpit. That's part of the customization that you're unlocking is like different colors, different designs for the the radar, stuff like that. But then also like fun little things like an Ewok bobblehead that you can get uh, that's sitting next to the window. Right. So as you're flying, it's kind of bobbing around. Yeah. Bobbleheads um, in Star Wars. That seems weird. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, it's funny because like EA was probably the company that had its hand slapped the hardest for microtransactions with Battlefront 2. Yeah. You know, just a big oh, Star yeah. Wars game that came out and everybody was upset about them. So you see them maybe overreacting, going the other way of it's cheaper than a normal game. We're not doing any extra stuff like it's all in the box. Uh, I, I, we'll almost think, goes. I almost think it's like an experiment for them, right? Like very specifically planned in the at the boardroom level of like, OK, let's everybody, all, all our audience keeps saying that this is what they want. Let's see if it can make money. Like we'll go full full on. We'll just give them the game, no DLC, no microtransactions. Just here is the drop. It comes out. And if it if it can make money, then sure. We'll we can use that model. And if it doesn't, with like one of the biggest franchises in the world and with a game that people have been asking for for years and years, uh, you know, a, an, an outer space shooter with Star Wars ships, if it doesn't do well, then that answers a question for them, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's probably why they're being be. upfront about it too. And they're not, they're saying like, hey, we're not going to put any more work into this than we have to. Like they're not, until it makes money, yeah. we're not going to put more time investment into it, which I mean, it's cool that they're being upfront about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's one other thing that could be going on here. There could be a new employee at Electronic Arts that doesn't know anything about publishing yet. <laughs> that may have just been like, I'm doing this, making it forty dollars. That's Andy McNamara, right? Game Informer's former editor in chief, who just went over to EA. Who just just arrived. Thank you, Andy, for the cheaper game. (laughs) Hey, no microtransactions. That's why we actually we sent him on this mission. We did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all like uh, sub subterfuge on our part to get a really great Star Wars game. Uh, I told him his next quest is Dead Space. So, so hold on, guys. It's coming. 
Well, that's all right. Cool. So I, Star Wars looks cool. Yeah. Go ahead, Miller. I just I'm I'm excited about it. I want I want that game to be good, and I want to um I want to have a return to an, an outer space shooter that I'm uh I can be stoked about. I think the biggest dilemma here, the biggest challenge for them. And that it's something that often gets uh, forgotten when we talk about reviving an old concept. Because this is really, I mean, I know it's a new franchise, but it's really reviving X-Wing, TIE Fighter, that those yeah. games. Is that like, are, we, we all wear rose-colored glasses about old games and about the way that they played, right? Like, there are, there are whole genres that we, we totally loved when we were younger because it was a, an opportunity to... Uh, experience something that that we hadn't yet seen in video games and we probably in many cases overlooked things that well you know it doesn't really work that well it's not really that fun but there was something about the fantasy of getting to do the thing in this case fly around in x-wings and tie fighters that just totally worked and i i hope that there's enough things that have happened here that have updated the formula have made the feeling of being in a cockpit be exciting the controls to be manageable because you know if you really think about it and you think back to some of those games there was a lot of time that you would play in those those cockpits where you're just sort of holding down the stick and rotating right that's all you do you just rotate until oh finally you see something on your it, it, near your uh, crosshairs and you start firing or you start it, oh, <laughs> you start throwing up like hey, you know. speaking speaking of that uh this is playable in VR as well on both oh, for gosh. PC and on uh, PlayStation VR, all of it has crossplay. So whether you're in VR on PS4 or on Xbox, you can be playing with your friends. I think that's how yeah. I want to do it. I think I want to try it in VR. That'd be neat. Yeah, I might do that. We should. I'm excited to fly around in those uh, ships. Uh, like, what's your guys' favorite ship? What's the one ship you want to fly around in? I mean, that's the Star Wars for ship. sure. But I really want to take that U wing for a, a spin. That's like the new one that in Rogue One, Miller's probably there with me when you saw that thing take off and then its its wings kind of fold back. It was like, okay, that's that's actually the coolest ship I've seen since maybe. I mean, there's some ships in the, the prequels that are pretty cool, but I think that that U wing is is just a, a stunning thing that looks like it fits into that original trilogy. I'm I'm actually excited. I'm, I always was a fan of the A wing, actually. Yeah, that might be mine. I liked it. It's kind of sleek, uh, aesthetic, and and it's kind of this small little uh, ship that was zooming in and out of combat in Return of the Jedi. And I always remember as a kid being really excited about that. So I don't know. I want to see somebody out there on a speeder bike trying to compete with all these ships. (laughs) That's what I want to see. Just someone modded dying into the depths of space. Yeah, no, you can have a helmet on. (laughs) Okay, okay, there you go. That's lucky, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I love. All right. Well, I I know. Alex, not to jump on your shoes. Uh, we don't have time to listen to your we, Star Wars rant. We don't care uh, about I know it how yet. you feel. But I do want to hear about you guys, because you and Miller, I know what you guys have been playing. You've been playing a lot of Xbox games. Yeah. What's the deal here? There's a bunch of demos that just went up. Yeah. So right now um, on Xbox Live, you uh, and now Miller, they they listened to us. Uh, they have a spot. Yeah. I wondered yeah. if yeah. they had. I'm sure they didn't plan it out. They just listened to our stream. But um, right now you can go to the Xbox dashboard now and there's a portal or the store, but there's a portal mm-hmm. for the Xbox Game Fest demo event, which uh, 70 plus games as of this recording, uh, all I would say there's I, I think Destroy All Humans is the only like double A title because the, the rest are like indie, you know, it's, it's um, all it's all pretty small indie stuff, but not necessarily bad. Just, no. you know. Not necessarily things that you really know super well either. Yeah, and and their goal with this event uh, is to recapture kind of the E3 hacks experience of being on the floor and finding random indies or random games that you may not have been aware of until now. And I will, I have to say, from our first time with them, I there were some really good gems in there. Miller, what did you think? Yeah, I'd agree. I they they're doing something interesting here. They they've only promised for their availability. Uh, between uh, July 21st and July 27th. Um, and so after that, I, I, you, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those demos stick around after that, but if you really want to make sure and check them out, um, that's your time frame. Um, and there were several in there that uh, 
that didn't blow me away but to be just to be straight right of those 70 plus games there's some that i downloaded i played for five minutes and i was like this, this is not great but uh in the mix we uh i think both you and i came across ones that we thought were like wow this is this could be a really great game um a few of which we kind of known about and we've done coverage before on mm-hmm. um one of the I ones heard a lot of people talk about haven yeah haven was one? Haven was one of the standouts for me, for sure. Definitely. I think we saw a trailer for it some months back, and it always kind of looked really neat. And now we got to play it, and it's uh, it's an unusual hybrid. It's a sort of adventure exploration uh, relationship sim. Um, you you play these two characters, um, and uh, and I think the idea is that you can you can play them cooperatively eventually. This was a single Correct. player only demo, but I think eventually it's, it's built to be able to be played co-op. Um, and there are two characters who've crash landed their spaceship on this strange planet of floating islands. Uh, they're on the run from wherever it is that they came from. And we as the as far as the demo goes, we don't get a lot more info about that. Um, I love what's going on on Reiner's screen right yeah. now. Yeah, what are you? Are you just like pulling things from your your shelf? <laughs> He's putting on a puppet. I, I promise program. I'm listening. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you're. I, I saw those two characters. Maybe you're pretending those are the two uh, uh-huh. characters who are in love with each other because That's they are. What I was doing. Uh, mm-hmm. They uh, they crash land at their two kind of young people who are living on this uh, this island this island on this planet now, um, and you split your time between developing their relationship and back on their spaceship, like cooking dinner for each other and, and having conversations and, and things like that. And then you go out together into the, um, the outdoor area and you have an ability to sort of glide across the, the, um, the land, uh, almost sort of like floating, uh, at high speed is, I don't know how would you describe it? Yeah, Alex? That, that's is that right. Yeah. It's your, yeah, you're. Yeah, I think that's how I would say it. you're floating around at high speeds. Yeah, and right. You can, and you can drift, and you can drift, you and can turn and stuff, and and you're trying to, you know, you're you're picking up stuff so you can survive. So you're finding food and things, but you're also trying to find these flows of energy that will refuel your ship, um, and find avenues by which you like these sort of teleportation gates that'll take you to the other islands on the planet. Um, there's an RPG like combat system. That's kind of interesting where you, the two of you are on kind of one side of the screen, the monsters are on the other, and you've got to, in keeping with the idea of the whole thing being about a relationship, you have to coordinate your attacks. And so your one character is on your left stick and the other character is on the face buttons. Uh, uh right stick. Sort of, oh, sorry. Right, right stick. stick for me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, you sort of hold down a direction and you can both do like a blast attack. And if you both time that up at the same time, then it does sort of like a duo assault that does more damage. Yep. Um, that's cool. The whole thing's wrapped around this kind of like, um, what's going to happen with these characters, right? Like what the, the, the big investment is in the fact that they're in love with each other and that they're on the run and you kind of want things to Hmm. work out for them and for them to like find some measure of happiness. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I I was pretty into it. I think it's a, I think it's a cool looking game. Uh, it's got a really beautiful aesthetic kind of anime inspired, but, um, but, uh, that's cool. Any other highlights from the demos? I know you guys played a bunch of them. What, 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 you know, I thought you really liked Alex. Uh, one, I also like Raji. You want to talk about that one a little bit? Yeah. And, uh, it's called Raji and Ancient Epic, and it's from, uh, Nodding Heads Games, which, um, as Miller pointed out yesterday in the stream, they were very upfront on saying, We are an, um, an Indian developer making a, a game that is focused on Indian traditions and, and, um, and folklore and, and religion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you play as the titular character Raji. Her brother gets taken, um, and and you kind of have to f- fight these these creatures to to get them back. And that doesn't necessarily sound like you know. It sounds like a, a a similar tale to what we've heard, but because the visuals are so distinct and the where the the game is coming from, I I found really interesting. Uh, Indian culture to me is very. I I don't know a ton about it, so it's it's a blind spot for me. <laughs> Um, but on top of that, I found the combat really interesting uh, because it's not just, I think a lot of people look at it and just go, oh, it's just a, a you know, top down action brawler and stuff. But they they merge platforming and combat in 
pretty cool ways and especially for it being a demo i'm not sure when exactly it's coming out but it really felt polished and engaging in a way that i get i really wasn't expecting um so that was that was a, a good really good surprise for me yeah, not, not so much because of, of any proximity in, in geographical location, but actually because of the gameplay. It reminded me some of uh, Prince of Persia Sands of Time. Um, like there is a, a sort Not of like me. 3D perspective on the um, action <laughs> um, and you're, you know, you're climbing pillars and you're platforming across uh, and you, uh, you're doing wall running and things like that. And then the when you get into a fight with these demons, you're using this like magical spear that uh, that lets you do all sorts of cool actions that integrate what you're doing in the in the traversal. So you might like wall run up a wall and then leap off of it and do a slam attack, or you might swing around a pillar and stun the enemies that are nearby. Um, and so, alongside a really cool uh, kind of narrative that's rooted in uh, sort of the Indian subcontinent's uh, culture and and uh, uh, and mythology and stuff, it, it just feels different. Um, and that I, I found that very welcome and interesting. Yeah. Or what was that one called again? Uh, Ra- called, whoop, go ahead, Miller. It's called Raji, an ancient epic, um, cool. which I thought was, uh, thought was a good one. Yeah. I know um, one other one that Kim was really excited about was Chris Tales. Yes. You guys mm-hmm. played that one, didn't you? Yeah. And we didn't, and unfortunately, that was one that didn't necessarily stream the best because it was a lot of dialogue. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I think people should give this one a shot because the way that they play with time is so interesting to me. We talked about it on stream, but like uh, basically you from what what I played, it's it the street, this the scene kind of cuts into like this cone where on one side, it's the past, your character inhabits the presence and present. And then on the other side, it's the future. So as you're walking around town, you know, you're seeing if I walk by there's there's a woman and her child um, in the present. And if I go to the to the left and the they're in the future, like the kid's grown up and and uh, the mom's older or like, you know, if I scroll to the other side and I see them in the lens of the past, kid's not there and the, the, the mom's younger and stuff. So I think it plays with time very interestingly. And I and I, I didn't get a taste for how that is going to affect the combat. But Kim seemed really high on that because she had played it before. Yeah, that game looks real ago. cool. Art yeah. style art style is just amazing yeah yeah it's got this like hand-drawn look that that's really beautiful and bright and and uh exciting it definitely is a is a um attempt to emulate a lot of jrpg uh elements both in in combat and in, in kind of walking around and doing dialogue with townspeople and that kind of thing but uh both its look and it's it's playing around with time thing give it a, a totally unique identity um and I think that uh, that's definitely going to be one of the standouts, even though because it was effectively a JRPG uh, or modeled off of JRPGs, it's hard. It was hard to take a look at it in a, you know, 20 minute segment, right? Because yeah. the beginning of the game doesn't exactly reveal a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think that would, if you were looking to try to find things in that mix of those demos that you should download and try, that would be very high on the list. Um and then, you know, we won't belabor it too much, right. but a couple other ones that I would I would call out uh, without going into detail. Scourgebringer is one we've previewed before, an awesome action roguelite. Um, I, I download that if you have an opportunity. D-Leveled is a really cool uh, kind of uh, physics-based puzzle game. Um, and, huh. um, and I'd also point people towards one that uh, I tried called Kaze and the Wild Mask, which hmm. is this sort of... Uh, it's sort of a it purposefully retro kind of 16 bit looking game uh, that it models itself off of a mix of Sonic and Donkey Kong Country. Um, and uh, you just it, it's exactly what you would think it would be. You're, you're moving through these sort of side scrolling levels and collecting coins and gems and things like that. But um, solidly designed levels and, and, and attractive looking monsters and, and animation and stuff. I think it's, it's, it'd be one. Uh, worth trying out that's awesome and there's over 70 games so it's you know if you're bored this week you yeah. really have no excuse yeah <laughs> unless you don't have and an xbox I guess. they're around excuse, till when but... when can you play them till the 27th that's right so so this monday um it's basically a week-long event and then um they just haven't said i mean i i think if they all went away that day then we shouldn't be surprised but i'd be a little um 
shocked if that happened. I, I bet some of them may may stick around just because they'll the the publishers and the developers who've made them will want more people to play them. But if you want to yeah. be sure to be able to try these out, I would do it here um, over the coming days. Cool. Any other major highlights on your playlist, guys? I got two. Yeah. I reviewed Carry On, mm. which is I was really pleased you... about that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's like playing uh, John Carpenter's thing, the the creature, if it wasn't in humanoid form, you know, where you are uh, this uh, unidentifiable blob of tentacles and teeth, and uh, it's the just art a cool style premise. Amazing. Yeah, there's no real story. You you just kind of like wake up in a lab, you're freed from this containment unit, and you just got to get out. So that's that's the whole game is just figure out as this blob how to get out. And there's a lot of scientists that you eat along the way, a lot of security that you you foil, and more than anything, doors that you have to open. Uh-huh. So the game falls into some pretty repetitive loops. It's a lot of people thought it was going to be like Metroidvania, right, where you just have this big sprawling map and while that's the case, they're all interconnected smaller units. So it's like uh, you have one area that you explore. You can't really get lost in it. You solve some puzzles in it to release these seals on a door, right? So you figure out one puzzle, go nest in this one wall, spread your tentacles throughout the, the facility. As the seal you do. is released. You do that like four times. The door opens. You move on to the next smaller area, right? You can backtrack. And you'll need to at some point. It's awesome. Um, but it gets so repetitive. Like these motions that you go through and the puzzles that they do are not super inventive. They're they're pretty easy to solve. You're just kind of going through those motions as well. I do like how the alien is used. It, it moves. I mean, it's awesome. Like you just move the analog stick and its tentacles are always latching onto stuff. So even if you're going up platforms, you just hit up on the analog stick and he's going up that way, right? Uh, so you don't have a jump button or anything like that. It's just very fluid how it moves. I love that. I like the tentacle strikes. You can latch onto an enemy and then toss them around using the right analog stick to move the the appendage, right? Uh, that stuff's very cool, but just the flow, it, it's, I don't know, yeah. pretty pretty mindless, uh, pretty repetitive. And, and I kind of grew bored of it after, you know, just you a few it? minutes. Uh, a, a 725. You know, it gets better at the end. The last act, they really let the beast kind of be unleashed and it just goes bonkers. And that's where it really kind of hits uh, a high gear and it's really fun again. You know, the very beginning where you're just experiencing it, you're like, oh, this is great. And then the very end where it's like, here's the true potential. Um, Everything along the way is opening. Yeah. Opening doors. My second game is Neon Abyss. Oh, sorry, Miller. Go ahead. All I was going to add to it is that, like, I played it in preview and and had pretty similar feelings to you. I mean, one one thing I would add that I'm sure you had the sense of as well is that it's it, they kind of really go in for the the vibe of it being kind of disturbing, right? Like yeah. you're playing this this monster uh and you know, you approach these people and they are terrified of you. Like you're hearing these people scream with full knowledge that they're about to get devoured. And yeah. uh uh and they they lean into that a lot with the way that your character moves and with the just the sort of merciless nature of your of what you are um and so it it definitely has that kind of uh reverse horror movie vibe to it yeah that's a game that looks really cool and i thought it demoed really well and i was i was really hoping it would turn out a little bit better but that's a bummer but maybe it's still worth checking out it's okay it's okay yeah Yeah, it's uh, i'm a little hard on it as i talk about it here but it's okay you know they do a lot of things right and uh like the movement and stuff like that it's just what you're doing it to you know or how you're flowing through the lab is is just kind of mindless at times right it it just kind of loses that charm pretty quick of being this beast and you know lifting people off of toilets and stuff like that i guess that never gets old whenever you come across a bathroom you know you smile (laughs) (laughs) uh and then the other game was neon abyss which is a side-scrolling roguelike with randomly procedurally generated uh, levels. We've heard this song and dance before. It has a really cool 16-bit, colorful, true to the name, neon-like aesthetic, and um, really nice variety in uh, weapons and abilities and stuff like that. So uh, that game's worth checking out as well, and it's on everything. Cool. Are we doing a review on that one? I don't know. I, I probably could at some point, but um, yeah, I'm I'm still early. But you're saying it's worth checking out at least. Yeah, yeah. I've, it's kind of my little go-to game between playing Ghost of 
Tsushima, you know, just like Tsushima. And now I'm all backwards Tsushima, on yeah. the name too. I think it's Tsushima. Uh, Tsushima. Uh, in between big hour, two hour long bouts with that game, I'll play 20 minutes of, of Neon. Well, speaking of Ghost of Tsushima, that's been my game that I'm still mainlining. I'm getting pretty close. I'm almost to the third act. I'm really liking it. I really want to see where it's going. So uh, I know we talked about it a lot last week and I don't really need to talk about it too much more. I think I'd rather have Nate Fox talk about it, who's the creative director, Ooh. as promised. Uh, but before we get to him, we'll do a quick ad break and then we'll be right back. Ad break? What? Ad break. Ad break. Ad break. You're damn right, ad break. Before we get to our awesome interview with Nate Fox, I want to shout out this week's sponsor, which happens to be Ghost of Tsushima. If you haven't checked out Ghost yet, I highly recommend you do as it's one of my favorite games of the year. The story follows Jin Sakai, a samurai warrior who's looking to protect his home of Tsushima and rescue his uncle from the Mongol invasion. Unfortunately, those Mongols play pretty rough, and Jin will need to sacrifice parts of himself in order to save his uncle and reclaim his home. The game is so beautiful with an amazing color palette, and if that's not your scene, you can turn on the Kurosawa mode, which is a black and white mode that lets you experience the game like you're in a samurai movie, which is very, very cool for me as a cinephile. If this sounds like it's up your alley, which if we want to be friends, I kind of hope it is, go to your favorite retailer, whether that be online or GameStop or wherever you buy your games, and go pick it up today. It's only on PlayStation. It's rated M for Mature. Now, Mr. Nate Fox, take it away. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Reeves. I haven't changed. I'm here with Alex Stadnick. How's it going, Alex? I'm good. I also haven't changed, except I need a haircut in the worst possible way. But moving on, <laughs> not important. You know who, who has changed? We have a very special guest uh, today with us, Nate Fox, the creative director of Ghost of Tsushima. Yay! I think I pronounced that incorrectly. You nailed it, Ben. That, did I? <laughs> I had my doubts, but you, you did a great job. <laughs> uh, well, I have definitely mispronounced it several times throughout my life or just the last year <laughs> uh, and my first question actually i'm curious did you guys ever have reservations with that name were you thinking like maybe we should go with a name that's easier to pronounce for western audiences uh we we, we did try on a lot of different names but and to be to just let you know that was our placeholder first name ghost of tsushima and we tried all these other names and uh we just kept going back to it because when you hear the name Tsushima, while it has a, a sound that you're not used to and that PS, it, it sort of lodges in your brain. It has its own identity. And so the game, like you hear Tsushima and it, it is just its own thing. Whereas Ghost is a little bit more generally used in video games. Tsushima is not. Yeah. It says you're going to Japan, Ben, which I think is the core promise of the game. No, and you nailed that. That's so, on that. Congrats. Yeah. And despite the name, I've, actually, I like the name, but I just feel like some people might, I don't know, rub them the wrong way. Who knows? Just because you can't pronounce the thing. But <laughs> but congrats on the game, by the way. It's out. Hey, it's getting rave reviews. Uh, you must feel pretty good, right? Oh, it feels amazing. I mean, to work on something for so long and then uh, see it get out there in the wild. Yesterday, I was watching people stream it and it's it's like a game designer's dream to hear the stream of consciousness coming out of the player while simultaneously reading comments on the right. I feel like I can crawl. In, I, I, I experience people's subconscious while going through the game world. It's 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 outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. The best part of the game is, I mean, in my opinion, there's a lot of good parts of the game. One of the best parts is the way it looks. It just looks incredible, which I'm sure, sure you guys are aware. And you guys went to great links to make it look good like every shot in the game looks like it could be part of a painting or something but what are the tricks to making a game look good because like you make it look easy but if it were easy every developer would just make their game look amazing right so what did you guys do to make this look amazing well i think the first step right is finding excellent artists sucker punch is really lucky to have a incredibly talented and elite squad of artists that come self-reinforcing because they keep challenging each other other to, to to do even better and better things. But the second part is reserve. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima, when you go to a, a yellow forest, it's yellow. When you go to a field that has a lush landscape of lilacs, it's just that one color. So color itself becomes a landmark, 
in the game world. It's not strictly realistic, but it creates a more powerful impact on your mind as you ride your horse up and down these hills and through forests. Yeah, for sure. Did you guys actually have people go out to Japan and take a lot of photos or was it a lot of Google searching? Oh, yeah. We absolutely went on a couple of research trips to both Tsushima Island and uh, mainland Japan. I think those are invaluable. Our, our objective, of course, was to create a feeling of authenticity to the landscape and the people that were in it. And without those research trips and without the, the guidance from Japan Studios who hosted us on those trips, we would have been sunk. Yeah, wow. sure. Yeah. I'm actually curious about that authenticity because you guys were, were clearly inspired by history. It's, it's set in a real historical setting, uh, but you were also very inspired by samurai films which are sometimes not historically accurate and sometimes can be. But uh, what was more important to you guys? Was it to be authentic or were you more interested in conveying a certain feeling? Well, while our game is, is inspired by a real moment in history, it is absolutely a fictional story. So our island is not like a stone for stone recreation of Tsushima. It is a collection of biomes that are meant to impart a feeling of these classic samurai films. So the real target for us was to give players the experience of interacting inside of a classic samurai movie. And so that really is the authenticity target. Um, nobody has all the details of what life was like in the year 1274. But if you're familiar with a lot of these period dramas, then you have an expectation of how people will operate. Since all of us at Sucker Punch, or most of us, did not grow up in Japan with that kind of cultural um, understanding, we had to reach out to experts so that when we put the game world together, a person who was familiar with these films or TV shows wouldn't get thrown out of the fantasy by the feeling not being correct to what they were used to inside of these historical dramas. Mm -hmm. Sure. Anything point out or stick out to you in your mind or memory of, we were doing this and the expert said, no, you idiots, this is wrong. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, my favorite example was uh, we had a scene where somebody was drawing a bow. And so we were, we're mocapping it. And they do this like they're Robin Hood. And she says, oh, no, 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 no. She comes over. She takes the bow and she goes down as she pulls. And this woman has been training in archery for a long time. And instantly you could tell that that was the correct thing to do. It was nothing that any of us had ever uh, known. But we you guys don't shoot it. bows and arrows every day over lunch? <laughs> oh, she had, uh, I think she had taken in uh, high school in Japan a lot of archery. And so she knew how to draw down from above while she pulled. That's so much cooler than my gym class. Wow. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I wish I had had that option. Yeah. But you see it in the game. I mean, Jin, when he draws down his bow, does it. And it's the, it's the traditional way in which you draw a bow. And yeah. Thank goodness that uh, we had some motion experts around. Otherwise, we would have just bonked our head against this beam, a bunch of fools. Uh, so I'm very grateful. Did she show you the traditional way to like throw a grappling hook while jumping off a horse? <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. also uh, an authentic thing. That one, that's a little harder. Yeah. Uh, it, not as much research was done to figure out how that worked. Um, or I should say, many people died. Trying to get the mocap. Those poor interns, Amazing. man. Those poor <laughs> yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to, uh, we started talking about Jin. What was it that intrigued you guys about doing a samurai story after the superhero tales that you guys told with Infamous? Well, we were kind of a little tired of making a superhero game, I and mean, we've been doing it for so many years. We wanted to try something new. And a lot of us have a real love for these samurai stories, whether it be from comic books or from movies. This idea of being a wandering samurai in feudal Japan had an incredible allure that got our imaginations going. It seemed like a great fit for an open world game where a swordsman walks into town, there's a problem, and he solves that problem with his wits and his sword arm. But we, we needed a, a core conflict, both from an external threat and an internal one. When we 
came upon the Mongol invasion of Tsushima in 1274, it was an excellent external conflict. Uh, you understood the stakes, why this person needed to fight back. And the internal struggle was uh, this just one statement about narrative, which is a samurai must sacrifice his honor and become something new in order to save his island home from invaders. So that was it. That those two things, this desire to be a wandering samurai in feudal Japan, which is so alluring, and the basic narrative premise of this invasion where a samurai has to transform into something new at the cost of who we thought he was going to be. And we were off and running. Yeah. 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 Samurai is so cool. Did you guys feel like you've nailed down why they're cool? Like what, have you distilled down, like what is it about samurai that resonates so well with us as humans? I think that samurai have a lot of dignity and stillness that you don't see in action heroes. They are generally uh, people of few words, and when they threaten somebody, they don't uh, make a big show of it. Pretty calm, and they don't, when they act, it's with lightning efficiency. Also, particularly in the movie The Seven Samurai, which is for me the, the real touchstone for how I think of samurai. There are these elite warriors that show tremendous respect to everyone around them, and they get a lot of respect. They selflessly fight with heart in a way that you don't see in a lot of Western um, sword fighting kind of situations. That's what makes them so admirable is that they're, uh, they feel like they're, they're morally trying harder than the rest of us while simultaneously being elite warriors. Yeah. Yeah. You guys have mentioned a lot of the samurai films that you were inspired by uh, throughout the course of, you know, the game. But if people only had time to watch one samurai film, what would you recommend they watch? Is it Seven Samurai? I would totally recommend you watch Seven Samurai. It is a masterpiece. Cool. I'll have to do it. I yeah. haven't seen it. I haven't seen it yet. Either. What? Yeah. Are you, yeah. you guys are, you are in for an excellent afternoon. Well, Ben, I think we have our weekend plans. I think we know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Just over and over on yeah. repeat. <laughs> yeah. Um, you talked about earlier how you guys wanted to ground this, this story in, in the actual conflict while st still be having the freedom to tell your own tale. Um, and one of my favorite parts of the game so far has been the mythic tales. Have you, can you guys talk about how you developed that? And was there any temptation to take those and kind of like over not overblow them, but go even more mythical with them, more like into the lore. So the mythic tales are interesting because we wanted and we did make a totally grounded game. Um, however, the people that live on Tsushima Island, they have beliefs in some supernatural things like Kami. Now, all of the mythic tales are actually based in real Japanese folklore, or most of them. Uh, that the people of the island would have believed. For instance, uh, lightning dogs came down from the sky and they're the ones that burnt the sands of this one beach black. That is the creation myth that the people on the island believe, right? So there is an element of fantasy there, even though there are no lightning dogs. Uh, spoiler. So Jin starts participating in these stories, kind of looking for a weapon or a suit of armor or an incredible... Uh, technique that's been lost to time inside of these stories. And you get to uh, walk in the footsteps of some of these impressive events that had happened in the past, getting deeper into some of the cultural beliefs of the time. Fantastic. That's cool. Yeah. One of the main criticisms I've seen of the game or repeated criticisms is the open world design. People are kind of calling it not very innovative, let's say. And I'm just curious, do you feel like that criticism is is fair or valid? What was your approach when you guys were designing the open world? We made this game to be an anthology of stories. So certainly there's the main character, Jin Sakai, who has this transformation arc from samurai to become the ghost. And I view that as like the, the, the trunk of the tree. But then there are all these branches, these side characters who you meet along the way that have their own stories you can get lost in. And more stories on top of that that you can find just people in need around uh, the island. It's an anthology of stories. And it's built 
for exploration where we do not tell you where to go. Uh, we only show you where the next Jin's journey mission is so that people will get lost and they'll figure it out on their own and it'll be their own experience. The amount of things that are in the open world that could uh, be overwhelming just because there's so much that could contribute to somebody's fatigue at just the raw scale. It's meant to be there as something that you discover on your own, not to be a, uh, a really expansive checklist where we expect you to do everything. Really, I don't expect players to see everything in this game at all. I expect them to chart their own course and find things in their own time uh, because they were just following their curiosity and then swim forward through the story. Sure. Uh, certainly, that is the, the hope. I think the game's at its best when you get off the main path and you just follow something that catches your interest and you daisy chain from one thing to the next to the next. But not, I don't think you have to do everything there is in the game, in fact. I think the more important thing is that you're just always following your current curiosity. Yeah, that's that's interesting because one thing I notice while I'm playing the game is I feel this sort of need to slow down a little bit and just sort of take everything in. Whereas a lot of times when I play open world games, I'm kind of like, Here, where's my checklist? I'm going to do everything. But this game almost wants me to, you know, take in the beauty a little bit, slow down. Uh, was that something you guys were conscious of when designing the game? Was there something you put in there to like, how do we slow down players and let them just enjoy the space? Absolutely. Early in production, we did have a lot of the standard open world UI devices. For instance, like a, um, a waypoint marker in screen space that would tell you where to go and how many meters you were from your objective as you rode your horse across a field. And you ended up just looking at this marker, watching the meters tick down, tick down, tick down, tick down, tick down, tick down, until you got there, like you were on a, a long distance flight. And it took you very much out of the moment. So the guiding wind feature says, oh, look, your objective is this way. It doesn't give you completely concrete information as to the right GPS path. It doesn't uh, tell you how far away you are. And as a result, you find yourself very much in the moment saying, how am I going to steer my horse around this rock? Or uh, as I do steer my horse around this rock, I notice a plume of steam to my right. Oh, that's a, a hot spring. I should go there because it will increase my health. It's something you discovered with your own eyes, your own senses, because you were actually looking at the environment, scanning for opportunities. And to me, that is slowing down. That's being present in the right now, not thinking about where you're going to be, but just right here in the moment of travel. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking to you earlier and you mentioned uh, Yusagi Yojimbo, the comic, as one of the inspirations where you had started reading that all the way back during the Sly Cooper days when you were researching that game, but that helped kind of inspire this game. Um, do you think some of that, those threads from way back when still have carried forward into Ghost? The comic book Yusagi Yojimbo was a terrific influence on, on me personally. In fact, our main character, Jin Sakai, is named after the author of the comic Usagi Yojimbo, Stan Sakai. That was my way of saying thank you, Stan, for this amazing work of fiction that is such an incredibly gracious entry point for people into samurai fiction. Usagi is a very calm, uh, caring, and just ruthless opponent if he needs to get something done. That sort of samurai spirit tried to put into Jin Sakai. I had the writers all read these Usagi Yojimbo books because I think they do such a good job of efficient, clean, and emotionally impactful storytelling. Yeah, that's a great series if anybody's looking for something to read. Are you still reading comics? Oh yeah, what am I, dead? Of course I read comics. <laughs> <laughs> what are you reading these days? Oh, I I'm just dumbfounded at how when you read a comic on your iPad and it only shows you one panel at a time, how that changes the dynamic of reading comic books because you get a reveal with each panel. When you're reading in a book, of course, when you turn the page, you get the big splash and you go, oh man, that's, that's where the event happens. But it's so impressive when you read on your iPad because every one of them is, uh, is just a reveal. 
So what am I reading? I'm reading, uh, as actually, I, I am still reading Usagi Ojimbo because there's so much. Um, I've been reading some of the, the Star Wars comics that have come out recently that use uh, Darth Vader. Uh, you can, oh, wow. I, I, I'm a big Star Wars nerd, so I would love to jump back into those stories and see those characters. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, it kind of fits, too, because, you know, Darth, the samurai were an inspiration for Darth Vader's overall look, so that's kind of cool. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Hidden Fortress? I have not, no. Famously, Hidden Fortress is one of the big um, influences on Star Wars. If you, and it's an Akira Kurosawa film. Okay. Oh, samurai movie. And in this movie, you will see some Japanese peasants that are very similar to C-3PO and R2-D2. Really? Interesting. Yeah, dude, you should check it out. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I love Star Wars. Star Wars is the pinnacle, but you can see just how all of us as human beings, we stand on the shoulders of other people as we all try and make art, you know, enjoying what we saw when we were young and then building our own thing and somebody else will build something on top of what we build. It's, it's a continuum. So Dark Fortress and Seven Samurai, my weekend is oh, complete. Yeah. Hidden Fortress. Hidden Fortress. Hidden Fortress. Yeah. Okay. But start with Seven Samurai and then maybe actually watch Yojimbo and then watch Hidden Fortress. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm running on a weekend. Yeah. I don't know if I'm oh, going to have man. time to eat. <laughs> what are you talking about? Wait, life is now perpetual weekend. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Who am I kidding? My life is a sham. Oh, oh uh, no. <laughs> Alex, I know you had a couple other questions. For sure. Uh, going back to the combat of the game, which I've, I think has been one of my favorite parts on how solid it feels. What did you, what did you find yourself gravitating towards? The, the ghost path or more the honorable path when you would go into, go into to confrontations? Well, I am, a, around the office, I am known as a true coward when it comes to fighting. So I use the bow to take people down with headshots as much as possible. And then I will sneak in and try and uh, stab people, but I will fail at some point. And then it's sword fighting time. So you, that's, that's, that's my game plan always. I bow it up, then I do some stealth, till I mess it up, and then I will sword fight. You're truly a man after my own heart. I appreciate that. Yeah, just the most chicken path possible. Yeah. It's more incredible. However, if I'm going across a field and I see like a little pack of Mongols, you know, like maybe they've got a prisoner or a cart filled with, with something I might want, it is my deepest pleasure to walk up to them and call them out for a standoff. To me, that is the quintessential samurai experience. And if it's a small enough group of guys, I'll do it, but not against a huge pack. For sure. Yeah. For well, sure. With small groups like that, too, you can like chain them. Get like three guys out of the oh, way. Yeah, yeah. And oh, yeah. That so feels good because sometimes that's most of the group. Oh yeah, no, completely. It's it is that's a deeply satisfying aspect of the game, and I'm always surprised at how it feels good despite being so simple. Yeah, yeah. Especially those moments in Kurosawa mode, you get it's nail the the old samurai movie feel. Um, yeah. And speaking of of Kurosawa mode, was it hard implementing that when you had such a range of color and just such a gorgeous backdrop like was there kind of an internal debate on whether you guys should even have something like that with with how beautiful this game is no no i mean the game is very very much a love letter to these classic samurai films i mean just there's no doubt about it that is where we that's the heart that we're really going after and to put in um, that mode where it's black and white with higher contrast, where the wind gets ramped up, it's grainy, there's film scratches, the audio gets kind of dimmed down like it's from the 50s, or rather the 60s. It is, um, it's a way of letting people get closer to that source material. To me, it is identical to putting Japanese language on every uh, build across the globe. Because if you want the most authentic feeling possible, you're going to play the game in Japanese language. Now, do I think that the majority of players will play through the entire game with Kurosawa mode? No, I don't. I think that uh, we're all very used to playing games in color. And uh, the game looks wonderful in color. But I would 
hope that players turn it on and ride through some fields and get in a standoff and get that moment of saying, hot damn, this is just like those movies. Or maybe you turn it on for a, a duel because it'll take you there to the feeling of watching those movies. But it's your choice. You can turn it off, turn it on as you will. For sure. We had one of our, uh, our editors, Jeff Cork, just loves Kurosawa mode. He's playing through the whole game that way. Cool. And one thing he noticed is that there's parts, you know, the parts where you have the missions where it's, hey, look at this picture and find these purple flowers. It's like, those missions are a little bit harder, obviously. I'm yeah. sure you guys are aware of that. So what was the discussion like for stuff like that? Or like even the, there's like the moves you can parry or the moves that are red versus blue. Uh, what were you guys talking about during that mode? It's like totally worth it just because of the immersion. You like, you still have to do Kurosawa mode or did you guys talk about like maybe for certain moments having color? Well, we, we wanted to make the game playable in Kurosawa mode the, for like your friend. Um, and it ended up being something that got implemented, even though we knew we always wanted to do it relatively late in production. And it was very useful to us because by playing in Kurosawa mode, we learned a lot about what doesn't work for folks who are colorblind. Um, certain things like the, uh, the glint colors we turned into shapes so that you can that there's a difference between the glints in the, the the physical manifestation of them so you can see it in black and white or uh you know it is a video game so we have explosive barrels and uh they're red because it's a video game but people couldn't tell that they were the explosive barrels because it was in black and white so we radically increased the contrast on them so that you can make them out while in that mode same with the guide bird that comes to you it was a very useful device for us to see the world through a, a different lens, in this case, somebody who had a hard time discerning one color from another, and then make the game more playable. Mm. That's smart. Maybe all games should have a Curacao mode. It might help developers. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, maybe. I mean, it, it just, it kind of shocked you out of your, uh, your, your everyday experience. I mean, sometimes when I play uh, games that we're working on and I become too expert with the controls, what I often do is I, I hold the controller upside down and I try and play backwards. So I have to mirror my thumbs motions and where the buttons are. And I do this so that I experience what it's like to be somebody who's not totally dexterous with the joysticks or the buttons. Yeah, and, that's smart. Well, it's just a way to reset yourself so you're not just falling back on what it is you know through you know so many games worth of of so many years of playing video games but i felt like kurosawa mode did that a lot for those of us who uh see the world through a certain range of color for sure yeah that's awesome yeah have you guys ever tried playing a video game upside down not that i could think of uh, when I was a kid, yeah. I would do it. Yeah, I would like lay on my couch and like hang out upside down while playing games. And your brain gets used to it pretty quickly, I feel like. Interesting. Just yeah. hanging out upside down, yeah. Well, I think a lot of us, uh, there was this weird schism where right analog stick camera control, it was either um, you know, like a flight stick. If you press left on the stick, did that mean that the camera would rotate turning to the left or would it rotate turning to the right? And Half the games are one way and half the games are the other. And now all games, even though they still let you invert it, um, they, they all default to this one standard. But we, those of us who had the other way, we had to rewire our brains to have it make sense with that flip. And you get there. It's just you have to get used to it. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I can tell you guys were not tortured by this camera swap thing that happened. Oh, not tortured by it. I guess I don't spend a lot of time in my waking hours being like, ah, the camera. <laughs> Uh, I know I was going to ask you this, too, because I know we had talked earlier previously and you had mentioned you have this interesting theory about how theater kids make better game designers. Are you are you willing to share a little bit about that? Yeah, I will go on the record with that. Uh, I believe the best thing you can do if you're a teenager right now thinking I want to become a video game designer. It's two things, my friend. First. Get involved with theater. It is one of the few times when, as a young person, you're asked to participate in a creative medium where you know the curtain's going to go up 
and you can screw it up royally. So that pressure to make it good, to help the weakest link on your team, be it somebody who's making the set or is your scene partner, everyone works together with a variety of different disciplines, be it lighting or, or art or acting. And uh, you get to make something that evolves, iterates creatively, and then you put it up in front of people and you get the accolade or you get the shame of raw failure, but you experience what it's like to actually ship a creative enterprise. The second thing I would recommend is wood shop because you have a plan, inevitably you cut something wrong and you mess up that plan and you have to change your plan to make something that ultimately looks polished like you intended it to be that way when really you made like four mistakes along the way. You're adapting as you go and you're fixing things, rubbing things down so that it looks whole even though you, you, you are human and things don't always go the way you thought. There you go. Those are my pro tips to the youth of today to do game design. Unorthodox, but I, <laughs> I, it makes sense, honestly. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a wood shop guy, aren't you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, was, uh, I made a sign for a house, which doesn't sound impressive, but it's this cool like wood sign. And then uh, we're actually working on a bench for our backyard right now. Hmm. And have things gone as you planned them? <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've had to redo a bunch of things. Uh, it's, it's challenging, but it's also rewarding, too. Like, when you're done and you have the thing and you look at it and you're like, man, this turned out, well, like, I built this thing. I yeah, used totally. scraps of wood and, and now I have this physical thing. So I totally hear what you're saying. For sure. So the thing about making games is uh, you come into it with this idea of how it's going to play and you, you build it. And then, you know, you experience it and it doesn't work exactly like you want. So you improve it. You change it. It iterates. You don't know where it's going to go, but that's part of the fun of discovery. Uh, it, is, it is very much a creative act where eventually, you know, the pieces start snapping together and it works. I'm sure that when you sat on that bench, when you're done with it, you felt a deep sense of satisfaction because you knew the raw components it was made of and it became something totally different because of your work. That's right. So if you need a bench... Come to me. Ben's yeah, benches. man. Yeah. I got the skills. <laughs> Alex, any final questions? Uh, I guess I have one last one, and it is uh, coming off uh, The Last of Us. I think there was, a, there was a discussion about whether games need to be fun in order to, to be video games. Um, and your guys' story deals a lot with suffering and loss and the brutality of war, but inherently, the combat and the exploration are, are very fun. What what is do you have an idea? Did you guys look at that? Did you just say, like, because of this subject matter, we need to be be beholden to some of those darker themes in our gameplay? Where do games need to be fun, in your opinion? Well, our game is about a guy who goes away from what he thought he was going to be. He thought he was going to be an upright samurai, a member of that uh, group that class. And as he starts bending away from the kind of the, the, the rules of war as he knew them, um, his life gets more complicated because it's just more efficient. It is kind of morally utilitarian for him to fight this way. And we wanted to take him farther and farther down that dark path so that he would find out there are some ramifications, there are some bad things that happen for acting in a purely uh, kind of brutal utilitarian way. That is the story. That's where you see his, his human tragedy of the relationship with people around him. That doesn't necessarily mean that the gameplay needs to be uh, unpleasant. Um, we want to keep people feeling like they are the hero character, not that they're fighting with the hero character. And if the, the character in the game screen is, uh, doesn't, doesn't, you don't feel like you can inhabit them because what they're doing is, is kind of slow or unpleasant for you to do and you want to put the controller down, the experience of being them gets uh, kind of, muddied for sure or you might be holding the controller backwards 
Yeah, right. I mean, our story is definitely one of uh, it is a it is an accessible transformation story. Um, we are not trying to keep people from uh, seeing all the nooks and crannies of what the world has to offer, even though the world has a lot of dark stories to show about how people survive in a wartime experience. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Awesome. Well, Nate Fox, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Really Truly. appreciate you coming on the show. Anytime you want to come on, just let us know for sure. Wait, I have an example of something that's not fun. That is fun. <laughs> okay. Let's hear it. Right, this is the yeah. perfect time to include that. Yeah. Okay, great. Great. So one of the things that I really like in the game that is a little weird is you can find spots in the world to compose haiku poems and you get a theme and like maybe it's death and you're looking around the natural world and kind of taking inspiration by a, a tree that maybe has a moss taking it over and ruining the bark and you pick a line that reflects death through the metaphor of the tree dying and we made that mini game and we got some feedback it's like hey man where where's the uh Where's the challenge in this? How do I get the best score possible? And you just have to say, this isn't about like fun in that way. It's not about um, dexterity challenge. It's about being there in the moment and just enjoying uh, this form of interaction, even though it's not pulse pounding. Yeah. yeah. And I think that is a, if, if I don't know if you call that uh, kind of, making not fun gameplay to me that is enjoyable but it's not uh video gamey gameplay i guess yeah definitely sure. cool yeah and actually i love those haikus so yeah. thanks for including them in the game yeah hey it's my pleasure <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool well i know you're in a rush to get going here um so <laughs> we'll let you go yeah. but thanks for being on the show really appreciate it oh man it is my distinct pleasure uh thank you guys for the time and the great questions and uh for following through and watching the seven samurai. <laughs> yeah. Next yeah. time. Yep. Next, next time we talk. Yeah. Hold us up. All right. <laughs> I will give you both a quiz. Okay, cool. Right, we great. should do a film review podcast together. I think it'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. great. Well, I look forward to seeing what you guys do next. So thanks again. Have a good rest of the day. And thanks for watching the show. Thank we'll you. Be right sir. Back. Man, what a fantastic interview. Again, we'd like to thank Nate Fox and his team at Sucker Punch and Sony for setting up this interview. We really enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. Let us know in the comments. And by the way, in case you forgot, this week's episode brought to you by Ghost of Tsushima. If you have yet to take Jin's journey, let me tell you, it is one of the best of the year and I'm loving every second of it. So if you want to buy it physical, go to GameStop or wherever you buy games, go pick it up. It's only on PlayStation and I can't recommend it enough. Now, back to community emails. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Reeves. Still got the same crew with me, Matt Miller, Alex Stadnick, and Andy Reiner. How's it going, guys? Good. Good. I'm still great. buzzing from that interview, man. That was oh, really fun, I actually. You guys, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Yeah, I don't know that we'll include interviews every week. That's not necessarily the plan, but we do want to have those from time to time. Because yeah. we talk with a lot of interesting people in the industry, and we want to highlight those voices. So it was there you go. Miller and I sit through that, by the way. Yeah, I really wanted you guys to see, like, this is how it's done. You ask a question, and they answer it. You're, well, you're what we're about to do right, right now, now ben. Yeah. yeah. This is crazy. You're, I'm learning new things from you every day, Ben. Glad I could teach you. Just please call me Sensei. <laughs> well, keep so that in mind. <laughs> we are doing community emails now, which is stuff that people write into us at podcast at gameinformer.com. These are questions. Sometimes people send in games. Sometimes people send in interesting thoughts that they just want us to talk about. What, what do you guys like to get in this email section? What kind of questions do you want? Anything specific that you want people to send us? I like your, your deepest, darkest secrets yeah. for us to expose to the world. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Start it with, that's start exactly it with Dear Diary. Yeah. <laughs> and just see where it goes. I, yeah. I, like, I like getting... Uh, uh, thoughtful questions right like i like things that make us like really have to um, pause for a moment and, and give it some thought yeah, yeah yeah totally i love games too 
but what I was thinking about this week, I was like, man, it'd be cool if somebody just was playing a game and they found one super small little detail, but like super insightful, small detail on this game they were playing. And they sent that in. I would love to have like just crazy, insightful thoughts on a game. So you can send that in if you want yeah. or questions. Yeah, I think I think this section is at its best when we balance those insightful, deep industry questions with just random silliness. Um, so I think as long as we can keep getting those, I'm I'm happy. Well, we'll see if we get silly today. So, yeah. So first question, Anthony from Nashville, Tennessee. He has a question. He says, game informants. I was listening to your show from Thursday and you all were making predictions about what we can expect to see from the Xbox in the future. And he said he and his friends had a similar conversation and they started riffing on the Halo Battle Royale, which their idea sounds very similar to yours as Alex, where the flutter kind of coming in from the sides. So that's cool. I don't know if we talked about that on the podcast or if that was on the stream. I think it was on the stream. And it might have been on like replay, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we definitely had the same thought. So I think I think they're on to something there. Uh, anyway, he goes on and he says, with Microsoft shutting down, I had another thought. He said, since they're shutting down Mixer, sorry. Oh, I was like, wait, down. do you have some news that he <laughs> Did you guys like get this share? news? Did yeah. you guys hear about We've this? We've been on the podcast for the last hour. And while we were, <laughs> Microsoft is shut down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, A lot changes. That's what the stream is about today. <laughs> yeah. No, with Microsoft shutting down Mixer and partnering with Facebook Gaming, he says, what do you guys think about the possibility of Microsoft strengthening their bond with Facebook and going into some kind of compatibility partnership with Oculus VR? I personally think that it could be a really good way to blow the PlayStation out of the water for the next generation of gaming. Uh, But what are y'all's thoughts? Hmm. I Hmm. think Oculus uh, has slowly but surely been building up a pretty solid platform all on its own um but uh i certainly wouldn't be opposed to special partnerships there i i wonder how that would work um in terms of um you know it's already you know a a pc platform primarily right like and so i don't know i guess maybe having having the ability to play it with Xbox would be the biggest thing, right? Yeah, yeah I think that's where he's going with this. Like, you could be able yeah, to yeah. play, yeah. hook up your, your headset into your Xbox console, and that would allow you to play better games. I, I, I think, think it'd be gen- awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think in general, the, the thing with VR has, in, in, has consistently been the, the dilemma that people, there's a lot of people who still haven't had a chance to do a lot of VR. I mm-hmm. think when you do, when you have even an evening where you go to a friend's and you try out and they're like, hey, listen, you got to try. I know your game taste and you should try this and this and this and you're going to fall in love with VR. I think a lot of people do. Um, I I was certainly not like a VR evangelist in the early days. I, I didn't really like having to think about having this big thing on my head and it looked kind of goofy and. Uh, it, I just didn't love it. But then I, there was a stretch there where I did some uh, review coverage of VR stuff and, um, and I, I warmed to it, right? I, I now think that it's a really rewarding and fun way to interact with games. It's not like it's taking over what I want out of my PC gaming experience when I sit at my desk and I have mouse and, mouse and keyboard, nor is it taking over what I want when I console game and I'm sitting with my controller on the couch. But it's like a, another category where uh it can be a lot of fun um especially if you have the space to do like full room vr right. where you're actually moving around and that kind of stuff that's the big so, thing a lot of people don't have that space unfortunately it, totally but but if there was availability to use the oculus on on additional platforms whether it was xbox or anything else i think that'd be great because it's just more people who have that opportunity to to check out that experience yeah i think it's yeah Sorry, you can go. I think I, I think it's definitely uh, it would be a game changer. Just think about that install base that Oculus brings. You know that what are they in year three now? It, it still feels like it's in its infancy, but there's hundreds of games. Granted, not all of them are worth playing, but there's some really great titles out there that that I think people would latch on to. And just having that, if they could conceivably have that available on you know not day one, but when day one of the VR comes online for for Xbox, if that's a a thing that happens that could be huge you know that that would be bigger than anything sony could bring with playstation vr if they came back with a new one 
even if they carried their library over. There's just so much more stuff on PC. Yeah. And I think I think about what Microsoft said in the past and how they really have said, no, VR is not for us and not what we're interested in. This could be a really easy way for them to test that market. You know, the the like Reiner said, the, the clientele is already there, you know, especially if it's if it's as simple as just plugging your unit into the the Series X. Um, but um, it, it would be a way for them to see how much you like users actually use it on there and see if, you know, it's something that they want to get into and develop for on their own. So I think it would be a big win for for Microsoft, too. Um, but I don't know. We'll see if they actually ring true with that sentiment of of not wanting to get into the VR space. But right. I think, Anthony, I think it's a great idea. I think we're all in agreement with that. That'd be awesome. I think as far as predictions go, it's a pretty bold one. I don't know if it's going to happen. I'd be surprised by it, but I think it is a good idea. I, I think Microsoft should listen to your idea. I think so whenever you boot it up, whenever you boot it up, you just see Milo, Peter Molyneux's little virtual child, <laughs> taking it on a tour of VR. Like, Come with me. He finally found Come a home. Play your games. Oh. <laughs> if these new consoles are like super powerful, though, to be able to like use them for your VR headsets and be able yeah. to play stuff that's like high quality VR stuff. If we could have more people be able to play stuff life like Half Life Alex, that'd be great. It's a no brainer. Yeah, yeah. That'd oh. be great because that's the, that's really the big barrier. The, the the two big barriers are the space that you have in your home, um, in a lot of cases, and then you know there's a lot of people who still just don't have uh, a home PC rig that can support what you, you know what you need. Uh, you kind of still need to have a pretty solid PC uh, to run high end VR. Yeah. So there's if, big bears. Yeah. years yeah um yeah all right next question jason woger from the ukraine he writes in he says hello everyone several months ago i recall uh, hello hi jason hello several months ago i recall matt miller saying that he studied mm. classical singing and composition in college mm. i am currently studying uh the voice work in kiev ukraine he's a foreign language student uh although he's originally from the united states uh so he says next time you have miller on for a segment i'd love to hear more about his experience studying this kind of thing he says what pieces did you sing for exams do you still write or sing or practice music in any form uh did you start working in games journalism and did that help you in any way did your experience in music help you in any way in the games industry I know it's a lot of questions, but Miller, I know you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, well, that's thoughtful that somebody uh, was remembering that that was a thing that I did. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, it, it's it's interesting to me. I, I think for a lot of people, you go through college and that becomes your time to find the things that you love and the things that you want to do for a career, right? And um, And I found that, like, that the more that I studied music and and singing and you know opera and classical art song and stuff like that the more i found that it was something that was that i wanted to keep sort of personal to me and that i i really love myself but i didn't really relish the idea of like going into a career with it whereas like simultaneously i was one of those guys who was like majoring in a bunch of different stuff in college and and i was also studying writing and and that more felt to me like something that i would be excited on a day-to-day -day basis to be getting money for right <laughs> like be pursuing professionally. And so that's what I started to do. But all that stuff remained pretty important to me. Um, and weirdly, I think my studies of music had a lot of, uh, had a pretty profound effect on how I've thought about games and um, and understand understood things like critique um, and and how to evaluate a piece of art. Um, and I, I pretty regularly pull in uh, stuff that I learned in those years majoring in, in music and and studying that stuff to the way that I approach a review game um, and the way that I listen to the the audio component of it, but also um, just the way that I think about um, what's what's valuable in a game and what's um, what's interesting to focus on. Um, all that stuff I think uh, had carryover for me. Uh, so it's exciting to hear from somebody who's like exploring that that aspect of their career right now and whether that might be something that they they want to do um for me i was kind of i was uh 
studying all sorts of stuff. Uh, I was doing a lot of like composition, like jazz piano composition and, uh, um, and songwriting and stuff like that. But I was also studying things like, um, uh, Schumann and, and Finzi art songs and, uh, Handel opera and, and, uh, um, and, and kind of all sorts of things, the musical theater stuff that I was singing. Um, and all of it was, uh, it was like a huge part of my life for years and years and years. And it still is something that's, that's important to me. And I still enjoy, uh, doing music. I still have a piano in my family house and, um, use it on a regular basis. And it's great. I, I wouldn't ever discourage somebody from continuing to explore that stuff, whether you decide that you're going to keep doing it forever or not as a, as a career. Fun fact, we hired Matt specifically for singing reviews, uh, but we're just waiting on the budget to go through for two things Matt needed. He needed a band room mm. filled with stuff, and then he needed a choir. Uh, yeah, a whole choir. He it. Ma- he, well, he said it had to be 12 people, so we're, we're trying to push that through. Okay. Yeah. And tell What's your band all, name? Oh. Gosh. Uh... <laughs> Uh, you put man, me on you the name there, man. Yeah, name it right now. Uh, uh, Miller Night. <laughs> Matt one, Miller and the Millerites. One night with Miller. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Miller Light. <laughs> hey. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, actually, he says, "P.S. Miller, please sing for me a bedtime lullaby." Uh huh. I'll send that to him in the Ukraine in okay. his native tongue. You're gonna <laughs> fly out to the Ukraine and sing him a bedtime lullaby. He he's not gonna know when it's gonna happen. But one night, as he's falling asleep, all right, Jason, hear my really next to him. <laughs> if you hear somebody walking through your house in the middle of the night, don't worry. It's just worry. Miller. Yeah, he's just coming for you. It's gonna be totally fine. It's gonna be like John Cusack when he puts up the uh, the boombox, but it's gonna yeah. be Miller with like a a chorus just behind a him. Yeah, yeah, with my twelve, 12 other people. Fire. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, exactly. stick if it's Miller Light. Yeah. All right, so we have uh, Mike from Rantol. Illinois, he's writing in. He says, I think photo mode should be standard in every game adventure. Hmm. He says, I'm playing Ghost of Tsushima, and the photo mode in that is robust. And I think I actually have spent more time playing with it than the rest of the actual game, which is crazy. It's that's awesome, dude. I love all things that you have control over, especially how the environment, especially how the environment animates while you edit the photos. I'm disappointed with Breath of the Wild, he says, and he lists a, a couple other games that had good photo modes. Anyway, his point is, he wants to know what you guys think about photo modes and if uh, what your favorites are. I think they're awesome. I, I really do. I think they can elevate a game and really create a, a long tail for a community that's into that game. You look at Spider-Man, like I, I follow a bunch of people on Twitter that are, are big Spider-Man players, and every weekend they're sharing like four images on Twitter of that they took in Spider-Man. And it's just, I click into each one of those. I'm like, wow, that game is just stunning. And, and you also like kind of salute their ability, you know, the, the player's ability to frame those shots. Mm -hmm. And they put a lot of time in those just to make them look right. Uh, I think, I think they can, they can be outstanding. And, and that sucker punch has done a good job with them. You know, whether it was the infamous games or, um, ghost, you know, it's, it's fun to use and i like how this one in ghost is more like almost like a gif maker too right like you get the flowing uh you, you get the flowing motion in your shots yeah yeah you mentioned spider-man i remember me and kyle and leo we all did a video on spider-man's photo mode i think we called it six stunts when we were doing that series and that was a lot of fun and we made it look like spider-man was dunking a basketball at one point which was really a lot of fun so that video is still on the site i think if you want to look it up but yeah, Spider-Man's photo mode was really cool. I remember having a lot of fun with that. And I thought Horizon's photo mode was was pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. I still see people posting photos from that. Yeah. Sony I is think... Sony has been a huge proponent of the the photo mode and and I think it helps that their games lend themselves to a cinematic quality. And I'm all for big sprawling games to yeah. to have some something like that. Ghost was especially um just beautiful. Uh, that that game and its environments uh, just just begs to to have still frames taken of it. And uh, they did a great job of giving you tools, not just to like take a shot of what was happening on screen, but to let you 
change the angles in cool ways, change the lighting, which, you know, I think that game deserves some awards just for its lighting work. Um, yeah. And the fact that you can set that stuff up so that you're like, oh, I love this shot of me galloping my horse across this this flower meadow, but I wish the, the moon was out. Well, OK, you just have that that tool at your disposal to do that. And then to add in that the, all the animated stuff where you can have like the cherry blossoms blowing across and have it be animated. Um, you you ultimately get something that is very similar to what the joy is for people who are actual nature photographers, right? Of like capturing something, huh. capturing a moment that mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is really unique and, um, and powerful and, and captured your imagination. Um, so I, I thought, I thought ghosts, I, I've never spent a lot of time with photo modes, um, in a lot of the games that we've done. I, whenever they're in a review game, I, I have, uh, I try to spend some time with it, but Ghost was one was probably the first that, independent of what I needed to do with it, I found myself just occasionally pausing and going in there, and and spending like, oh, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes just tweaking yeah. this. Because uh, it's not awesome it like that. Yeah, I never thought of it as like nature photographers. That's totally like very similar. You know, just mm -hmm. trying to find that perfect time of day and and the shot. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. And it's nice because you don't have to like wake up at six in the morning and <laughs> hike up a mountain. Absolutely. Cool. Well, next email is says, hello, I'm Joseph. And I would like to know if you guys have tilters available. We'll lower the specs. He says capacity is 4,000 pounds. The tilt angle needs to be 85 degrees and the fork length needs to be 40 inches. If yes, please get back to me with prices and the major major credit cards you guys accept. Reiner, do we still have any of those tilters available? Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll I'll let Joseph know. Joseph, your lucky day. Am I, the All right. only, am I the only one who don't know what tilters are? Is that just me? How do you not know? <laughs> These it's are the a questions. Big part of our business, Alex. Come, Come on, on, Alex. Leo is supposed get to train it. me. Ben before him, and then they just left. So I don't know. Uh, it, he's the video done. guy. Listen, it's after we're right. done here, we're gonna have a long conversation about our tilter business. <laughs> Perfect. I got plenty of time. All right, Mick from Maine here. He says, okay, I'll share a dream. Usually right. my dreams are super weird. Recently, I had a triple layer dream where I woke up three times inside the dream. And each time it was acknowledged that I was waking up, but then I had another dream. So the first one, I was about to go to sleep and I became anxious that I couldn't find my pet bat that could phase through walls. I was worried that it would get lost. Uh, <laughs> and then he was sucked into a black fuzzy vortex. The second dream, I woke up and my father was there and he was like, wait, this isn't right, which woke me up from my, I don't know what's going on with that part, uh, <laughs> which woke me up from my third dream, wow. which was really hard to describe. I was walking through a landscape of triangles, swirls, and a rippling sky. There was no sound other than a low rumble. It sounds terrifying. So yeah, uh, I there hope you go. there's That's no question. Dream. I hope this is it. Is this it, Ben? That was Mick from Maine. Yeah, I think Mick, you got incepted. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, but. It happened to you so there's probably some false memories in there now yeah nick careful with those pet bats too yeah, yeah you, you gotta watch out for them be Good careful Lord. yeah i did have like because i've been asking people like hey send us your dreams i thought people would send us like video game related dreams but people just send us a lot of dream <laughs> stuff but then we just want uh, their copy of dreams yeah that's, so we that's right yeah. that's what i've been I asking for <laughs> sony please i need the copy of dreams i don't have it yet <laughs> I think we should start interpreting these dreams uh, when they come in and yeah. uh, offering some psychological counseling to people. How would you interpret Mick's dream? Well, clearly there's some uh, uh, deep seated issues with bats, right? Uh, uh, maybe his father is a bat or a maybe, vampire. Or is, it, or is it more of a love that he doesn't want him out of his life? Yeah, maybe Ooh. his uh, he's always felt like he's a he's a vampire to his dad, uh, just sucking the life out. Think about that oh. for a second. Oh, I got dark. That could yeah. be it. Yeah. I would say it's very creative, like yeah. how these dreams float. There's there's a lot of creativity there. So maybe put some uh pencil to paper, do some sketches. Yeah. Let's see those. Send those next time. Send send your art of your dreams. Podcast oh, I don't know if I want that. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Sorry, the email for that is uh <laughs> video at gameforward.com. <laughs> 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 we actually do have a dream related question though because i've been talking about dreams so colton from texas wrote in he says i know you've been wanting to talk about dreams so i want to ask you guys if you've ever had a nightmare that was caused by a video game or a video game character oh oh yeah totally 
but not a character. I remember a very distinct sequence of time where I had like exhausting wake me up in a cold sweat nightmares about luminous. About oh, what? Damn blocks always falling and the music just like pumping up and and stressing me out. I there it was a point that I was playing that game all the time for I would sit there on a weekend and play for hours at a stretch. Hey, surely you guys have had that time where you're like you're really into a game and then you dream about it at night. Uh-huh. So like that can be like a like a stress thing too. And that's how it it hit me. It became like a nightmare thing and I had to, I had to like step away from Luminous for a while. Wow. Wow. That's wild. So do you think if you went back to Luminous now it would all come flooding back? Uh, all the bad memory? I think I'd have to have, you know, another 8-hour play session with it. So, but don't make me do it, Ben. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next week on the podcast, we'll be having Miller play Luminous <laughs> just endlessly. Yeah, I had a bunch of dreams back when GTA Vice City had just come out. I was playing that game a lot and I had a lot of dreams about it. And I remember one that was like a recurring dream where I was trying to get in my car and it was like I was in the world of Vice City, but it was actually me, you know, one of those dreams. And I couldn't get the car to move. Like it was one of those glitches where it had glitched out and the tires weren't moving or something was stuck you under glitched the car out in your dream. Yeah, exactly. But I was like, I didn't realize it was a dream at the time. I just thought my car wasn't working, but I, I had to go because somebody was chasing me and they were going to get me. And I kept waking up right before they got to me, mm-hmm. but it was scary. Yeah. It was kind of like more, maybe more of a stress dream than full on nightmare, but I did not like it. Not a fan. Yeah. So Colton, he actually had his own story where he says, I vividly remember having a recurring nightmare about being chased by the angry wiggler from Super Mario World. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the angry one good. would be would be wild. He says, I yeah. can't be the only yeah. one with this weird nightmare fuel. <laughs> GI community, uh, let him know. Let him know if you've had that similar dream. I know Mine I was more a fear of failure. Mm, so I was okay. playing in my dream, I was on stage playing com- professional pro overwatch uh and and they use mouse and keyboard but i had my xbox controller oh no and so (laughs) we're like in the backstage green room or whatever and i remember like putting the batteries in and it's like okay i'm good to go and then we got up on stage and then i hit the button and it wasn't turning on and i so i'm panicking you know it's like the crowd's cheering and all that and i'm just like looking for a cord taking the batteries out i'm probably did that for like you know, your dream space, a couple hours of trouble, you know, troubleshooting this and freaking yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, and then I woke up like didn't get to play or anything like that. And I just remember just waking up with disappointment in my mind. Right. Like you usually forget like those dreams right away, like when you come out of them. But like this one, it was just like that thought was like right when I woke up of like, oh, well, this is going to be a crappy day. <laughs> right. It was the tone setter. The the thing I love about that dream is the the reality that there are people in the world who've had something very similar to that experience. I, I often think about those poor guys who've been up on a press conference stage when something went wrong and their controller would stop working. Just how mortifying that must be, especially when it's like yeah. your it's your game. Right. And you spent the last like three months getting the demo ready and working out exactly what you're going to say. Then you go out there in front of like literally a thousand people in the audience and potentially millions of people watching as it streams. And then your controller stops working or something. Uh, That would be the worst. Yeah. This is not dream related. It just reminded me because of the guitar stuff. But do you remember back when I think it was maybe rock band was coming out and they had a E3 party where they had the who come in and play at, at we had a whole concert we went to. Oh, yeah, it was great. But they had like the band, the actual physical rock band instruments up on the stage mm-hmm. that people could before the concert could go and play the game up on a stage while people were watching. Yeah. And I, so I went up there with like some friends, I think Nick Jester, and like we were playing rock band. I was playing bass. And so I always tell people I open for the who. Nice. You did. Technically, that I did. A dream. I yeah. totally did. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a good time. Yeah. I miss those. I miss those rock band parties. They. uh that was a fun time. They were real fun. They were so good. And it was a nice free concert, too. Mm-hmm. All right. So Scott from Rochester, New York, he writes in, he says, Dear GI Crew, he says, I've been playing a lot of Resident Evil 2 Remake this week. 
and I really enjoy it. However, sometimes I become frustrated with certain enemy encounters in close quarters due to the lack of effective melee combat in the game. I was thinking to myself of how much fun it would be to tear through everything as Kratos instead. After being scared at Slis, that's not what he says. Ah. Uh, I didn't want to have Alex have to cut it out. Appreciate After that. being scared at Slis, sorry, shitless, <laughs> by uh, enemies jumping. <laughs> By enemies jumping out at me and eating my face, I thought it would be nice to turn the tables and almost reverse horror scenario. So that got me thinking, if you guys were granted a one-time power to replace any video game character with another character from another game, what would you choose? I would I would put Kratos in every game ever and see what he did to it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, what would Kratos do in Echo the Dolphin? What would Kratos do in MLB the show. Like I think it just you would every outcome would just be exactly what you'd want it to be. Just yeah. Unbridled chaos. Uh well, I would want to do that. I, my idea was was very similar because I've had a, like a idea for a movie script for a long time where it's basically like a slasher horror movie in a cabin, but then like the chainsaw guy comes and breaks into the house and tries to kill the guy, and then he realizes he's basically Superman and he's indestructible, and then like Superman goes on a tear and you know, murders he probably doesn't murder but because he's superman but he like goes and destroys this crazy family so like this idea is very similar to i like this like kratos or some kind of superhero character in a horror setting i think the flip of it also works if you put some really cutesy innocent like mario character into a horror setting that would be really interesting that was going to be so my mario answer is to move mario, mario cool. yeah move mario into like the the most uh crazy first person shooter like mario in doom i think would be very appealing to me i mean he's pretty fast uh so you know i think he might be all right would he um, be just shooting fireballs out of his fists i think he's got fire we at least let him have his fireball power up but otherwise he can hop on top of those demons heads i mean just we're not leaving him completely helpless um but i i just i don't know i'd kind of like to see his the expression on his face Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, Mario in Silent Hill would be great. I was about to say put <laughs> Luigi into Silent Hill. Cause, <laughs> Sorry, cause, I stepped on it. It's okay. Because he's already had the experience in the haunted houses. You know, maybe he's getting a little too confident. Maybe he's like, you know, I can handle any ghost. I can handle any spooky thing. And we put him into Silent Hill and see how he actually does. Actually, or maybe we should put Mario in The Last of Us. It's like, hey, Mario, enough of eating these mushrooms. What if the mushrooms ate you? Ah! <laughs> That's really good, too. I like yeah, that. Yeah, those are all good thoughts. I like <laughs> yeah. those. Yeah. Hey, where are those games? Let's make hey, them. Konami. Hey, game developers, where Nintendo. are you guys at? Yeah. Where are you guys at? We Just... always used to get the we always used to get these letters. I bet we still st sometimes get them asking us as if we were the ones making the games, which was always the initial thing that, that made me laugh. Why haven't you made X crossed with X? And and I, it would always blow me away because like it, it would just be like, well, those are two totally different properties owned by two totally different people. It's not going to happen. But they, you know, these people would get angry. Like, why hasn't this happened? I mean, <laughs> why hasn't Samus shown up in a game with Master Chief, I don't get it. It's yeah. so obvious, and you'd be like, "It's not, it's not going to happen, man." Yeah, like, it's not. On, it's not on us. <laughs> and then it's not on us. We can't make that happen for you. Uh, but I, you know, people remember, can dream. I remember one of those emails that, or it was the letter we got that we thought was really funny. I don't remember what the mashup was, but he was like, "Oh, it'd be great. It would have the biggest lands and the biggest waters, or something like that." It's like that phrasing. Yeah. It's like the biggest lands and the biggest waters. All right, well, that's what, that's all you need, right? For a for a good video game, big the biggest lands and the biggest waters, and you're all set. Big land, big water, big sky. Unless mm -hmm. you're the next Park Park game. Unless you're IGN, and then it's too much water. We can't have that. Yeah. Uh, in Miller, when we get those emails, sometimes I'd play along, especially the ones that would be like, hey, you idiots. <laughs> yeah. You you screwed up Metroid at Other M. Why'd you make it this way? And then I'd just be like, hey, man. Yeah, you're totally right. We'll fix it with the next one. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you can just write back. We got a patch coming. Should be good. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned for more. Hey, you still owe us money, actually, for that. Uh, Cool. Well, those are the emails, guys. 
Thanks Thanks for playing along. We did great. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, you guys got any recommendations? What's good on the site? What's good on the magazine? You know what I really liked? Uh, I was happy Jeff Quirk was able to talk a little bit about Kurosawa mode in Ghost of Tsushima. You should go check out his article on that subject. He uh, he played the whole game in Kurosawa mode. When I reviewed the game, I played most of it with full color, and I would switch over to Kurosawa mode every once in a while to kind of get the vibe down. And I thought it was awesome, but I thought it would be hard to play the game all the way through that way. Jeff did it, uh, and he's got some got uh, an argument for why you should maybe try that too. And so yeah. you should go check that out. That's a good uh, reminder that our sponsor for today's show was Ghost of Tsushima. Legally obligated uh, ad break here. Ghost of Tsushima, check it out now. Rated it for mature, but hey, it's a good game. Right, Alex? Yeah, and you can get it from uh, any retailer right now, uh, digital or physical, and you can get it, pick it up at GameStop. So oh, there you go. All oh. your favorite retailers probably have it. Every single great game. Yeah. yeah. I got some in my trunk, too. <laughs> oh, you could buy one from Reiner. Hot <laughs> off a Crazy track. Andy's video <laughs> game sales. <laughs> Track down Reiner's car and you're all set. Yeah. Can you please you know one. Can you please wear a trench coat and be like, what are you buying? What are you selling? Discount price, $59.95. Oh, mm. there you go. Maybe don't well, buy it than, from, from Reiner. Other than all the great games in your trunk, uh, what else should people check out, Reiner? Our, we did a Star Wars Squadrons new gameplay today. That's a video you can find on YouTube and okay. GameInformer.com. Mr. Alex is in that as well, providing color to my Star Wars enthusiasm. Very much and the Chris Collins And then we have so much. We have tons of Xbox news on our website right now for Xbox Series X, be it Halo Infinite or some other games that I don't know about yet, but it's on the site now. You can go check. Uh, yeah. All that stuff's there. Yeah. yeah, and that's a good point, too. Is like, obviously, we didn't talk about all the Xbox news that's happening today. That's because, spoiler, we recorded this ahead of time. Uh, but we will have a special edition episode coming out in a few hours yes. where we talk all about it. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm really hoping that I can direct people to the video of me crying happy tears that Master Chief is back and, and that whole game is looking good and that Fable's coming out. I want, I want to push people to that, but I'm scared to get my hopes up. But um, I would actually recommend that we have done uh, two days of streaming, as we talked about earlier. Um, we Miller and I and Kim and then Jeff Cork, uh, we streamed the Xbox Games demo summer event. And that was really refreshing to me, as I said at the end of our first stream, in that um, I, you know, it's our job to stay up and informed, shockingly enough, um, about games. And it was really cool to go into some of these smaller titles, not really knowing what to expect and, and to have a genuinely good time with them. So, um, and, and I think we just had a really good conversation about games in general. And I, I think you, if, if you're curious about anything, any of the things that we talked about on the show today, please go check that out. It's uh, the Xbox summer games, uh, event demo or demo events, something like that. You'll see it on the, the YouTube page, but we, we had some really good talks and there's some really cool indie stuff that I think people should be excited about. So go check that out. Awesome, guys. Well, thanks for joining me today on the GI Show. It was a pleasure to have you. I had fun. I hope you did, too. And thanks for watching or listening to the show. We'll be back at you just in a few hours about Xbox. But until then, game on. 